today we're going to cover uh, automation FX and give you a preview of uh, what it can do, the problems it can solve and things like that. Um, this is effectively quite advanced in terms of uh, some of the use cases and scenarios. So, you know, it might skip over your head in some places and I might not do a very good job in others uh, in terms of explaining it, but I'll, I'll do my best and, you know, feel free uh, to um, ask questions, etc. throughout. Uh, so the rough uh, kind of agenda is uh, just the usual kind of house rules and a little bit about unified FX, but the main content that we'll cover is a general theme uh, that kind of kicked this off, which is uh, effectively DevOps or cloud, which is kind of modern development type patterns and practices. Um, and, you know, uh, De DevOps is many things in some respects, and it's not necessarily what this is all about. Uh, it's just, for me, it encompasses um, an approach for how to take um, something, an operation component, and uh, just make it available, you know, in terms of automation. It's just a, a very positive way to do that, a modern, modern way to do it. So that's what I mean by kind of DevOps enabling. And cloud enabling is basically taking on-premise uh, Cisco Unified Communications and connect them securely and efficiently to the cloud. So that's really the kind of premise to take you through is uh, why we created it, which is that kind of strategy of DevOps cloud enabling, what we kind of class as legacy UC, because if you think about Cisco and Spark, et cetera, and all the things are pushing forward in that direction, that's the modern next generation Unified Communications. But, you know, we're still got a bit of but to go before we get there. Um, so the ironically, the legacy component, as you could class it, is an existing install base of uh, CUCM, et cetera. So that's the general approach that we're trying to kind of follow is the Cisco Spark uh, modern uh, enablement of uh, applications. So the different scenarios and ways that you can use automation FX or kind of run through those, and this won't be the only things you can do. This is just, you know, a, a sample. Uh, there's things like you can take the functionality of phone view, uh, probably roughly about 80% of the things in phone view, and you can automate and script them. Uh, so that's uh, something that's been requested for quite a long time. PhoneView is a very much an interactive application. You can see and control and manage your know, tens and thousands of phones, et cetera, and it's used extensively for those types of things. But uh, we have been asked on a number of occasions, can I automate it? You know, can I write a script to say, do this with these phones at this point in time, et cetera? So we now have a way to do that. And that's obviously one of the use cases. Um, another use case, this is just a more general kind of term, which is uh, CPI screen pop. So this is typically a, a generic thing where a caller arrives on a phone, usually as part of a contact center solution, but effectively a caller arrives on a phone, an agent's phone, for example, the calling information is looked up somewhere, a database, DIP, et cetera, and then to that agent or you know uh, end user, some information relating to the person that's calling them is popped up and presented automatically. So we'll talk you through how you can do something like that. Uh, messaging, so that's just general telephony, uh, sending messages you know, from Cisco phones to other Cisco phones, but now you can send them to other destinations such as webhooks. And in reverse, uh, you can receive webhooks or make calls to our API and send messages to Cisco phones. Uh, so we'll cover a bit about that. Uh, provisioning, this is just the general kind of, you know, as move changes from a database perspective and communication manager. We've got a, a new approach for uh, opening that up, uh, which we'll take you through. Uh, Cloud FX, which is one of my favorite technologies that we've built out uh, of late. And this is probably the first time we've really been uh, talking about it in public. Uh, in fact, even some of this automation FX stuff is the first thing we're really talking about in public in any detail. But Cloud FX is a particularly a uh, useful technique that we've managed to take our on-premise CUCM and uh, securely expose it to the cloud. And I'll take you how that works. Automated testing, that's another use case, one of many, uh, but obviously you can do the same things you could do in phone view, you know, make this phone call that phone and answer, make sure it connects correctly and all that good stuff and the audio is there. Um, that type of thing you can now uh, automate. It's like a subset of the automating scripting for view, but you know it's a use case worth calling out. And the way that we've uh, built this is with an open interface, so that it makes it nice and easy to <coughs> excuse me, nice and easy to interact with CUCM 
and the inner standard opens uh, open the way effectively via the over interface. And then we'll go into a little bit how to get access to automation FX. Uh, it's something that we're including with PhoneView 6.1 Lab Edition. I'll talk you through how to get that. And then we'll take you through some demos and uh, some conclusions. Now, the demos have, have uh, not had a lot of time to prepare them, so there might be a lot of hit and miss. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that part goes. Uh, the usual house rules is please submit your questions uh, using the Q&A panel. And remember to submit to all panellists so uh, one of the guys here can uh, uh, chip in uh, with some answers. Um, well, where relevant, we'll maybe pick up some questions through the session the first time, but uh, I've got some uh, a slot uh, reserved at the end to uh, cover those questions. But please submit them via the Q&A panel. Uh, Tim's a little bit refresher as usual on ourselves, Unified FX, preferred solution partner, three main products, but that's actually extended recently. I'm just not going to update the slide deck. Uh, on top of uh, phone view, uh, you know, as hopefully a lot of people are probably familiar with by now, uh, you know, scales to tens of thousands of phones and uh, used to manage quite literally millions of uh, Cisco endpoints. This is the kind of core technology that we've been able to use and build into automation FX. Uh, but what we've actually complemented phone view with recently is two new offerings, uh, which you'll be able to get separately as well. One's called Phone FX, which is effectively single phone remote control, all web-based, as well as uh, provisioning and changes, etc., cetera, uh, on you know, device information on communication manager. It's effectively crafted quite carefully to be ideal for help desk scenarios. The phone view is great for power users and administrators, um, but not as useful in some situations to um, you know, level one, level two help desk staff. Uh, but uh, phone FX is geared in that sweet spot to, to make their life uh, very simple and effective, and all browser based for the phone FX component that's been bundled in. And we also have another new component that you can also get with PhoneView Enterprise Edition, which we call Notification FX. And that is effectively messaging uh, en masse to all of your phones, Cisco phones, et cetera. And we're actually going to touch on some of that Notification FX functionality because there's an API component to Notification FX, which is available through the Automation FX API. Uh, Wobber FX, that's uh, some we've had for a little while now. And it's proven really popular because it is nice and simple. You can install it yourself. So it's great to take a trial and just spin it up and see what you think of it. Uh, it's really fast in terms of how it works. It's real time updates. It's got live browser data, et cetera. But we manage all that without any plugins. So you can view it from any device. Uh, Migration FX, that's been going great guns, um, building up steadily. In fact, I just noticed a tweet today uh, that that's the 79, uh, 45, 65, and 71, uh, 70, 75 series, et cetera, uh, all end of sale, end of life, et cetera. So I guess that's ultimately going to drive uh, a lot more requirements for the migration FX side of things. I guess we'll just be waiting to see if and when Cisco maybe retire those uh, handsets from CUCM as well in a future version. That seems to be the pattern of late. So that's uh, where we are today uh, in our product set with a couple of extra things um, that uh, we'll be updating this slide deck and covering, uh, uh, recovering again in the future. Uh, customer base, uh, nice and extensive. Don't need to cover that in detail, to be honest. Uh, but let's, let's get into the meat of the content in terms of automation FX. So the way I like to kind of position this is if you think about legacy unified communications your existing you know 100 million uh, endpoints worth of uh, cisco telephony that's out there today and in in use um it's quite tricky to say the least when it comes to integrations and you know application enabling that platform because there's uh, a lot of legacy type apis that use you know quite complex or archaic uh, integrations or and certainly varied integrations. So there's uh, you know maybe a mixture of uh, software architectures that are required. Uh, you can't just stick with one technology or language. You usually have to dabble into two or three if you want to go across certain uh, API types. There can be different levels of security and access control uh, to using those APIs that are specific to their use cases maybe, which might not be 
uh, too easy again to cross those boundaries if you want to uh, work with multiple of them. The data itself that you get or use across those interfaces, and I'm talking about things like the AXL, CTI interface, things like extensibility and the risk port, which is the real-time information service, that kind of thing that gives us the current registration status and IP address, et cetera, of the phone. If you want to programmatically access all that information, it, it's kind of tricky, right? And as I say, the data is split um, across those interfaces. So um, from the AXL data, if I'm in there looking at database, I can't find out the current IP address of our phone, for example. That's a totally separate place. And when I want to find out the IP address of our phone, it's very heavily rate limited as well. So it just makes it quite difficult uh, to work with uh, that type of setup. And a lot of those protocols are typically on-premise only. So you can't open up CPI to the internet, for example. example, it's not secure, uh, it's not internet friendly, uh, you know, in terms of transport, etc. And some of those interfaces are proprietary or closed too. So it just makes it really difficult, to be absolutely honest. And I guess in some respects, that's, you know, from a point view product perspective, as we've built that out, these are all the challenges that we've had to overcome in our own respect, just to create our products. Um, but the way we've taken that uh, integration that we've performed over the years and learned a lot and you know scaled up for some very large customers, we've taken all that experience and code base and we've made it uh, available effectively through this interface, which we'll take you through. But also, if you want to work with those interfaces directly, you're talking about very skilled and experienced uh, development resources. You know, it's probably as a rough guess, only about 10,000 developers in the world that have that relevant uh, experience of, of any degree to work with a uh, communications manager, maybe a lot less, maybe a bit more, but it's in that kind of ballpark. And ultimately that means if you want to do anything, you know, automate uh, anything pretty much on communications manager, there's always a high cost, uh, high complexity element to it. Whereas, if you compare this to the kind of modern DevOps cloud environment, and the way I like to think about it is, you know, cloud is a unique term. It's, it's actually one small part of it is running things, you know, in the cloud, so to speak. All this kind of grew and started from virtualization of, you know, operating systems and systems, et cetera, and then being able to orchestrate and effectively build the DevOps layer on top. And then the cloud, as in cloud systems like, you know, Amazon Web Services, uh, Azure, et cetera, um, all they're really doing is providing an interface with a GUI to it, but there's also always uh, a DevOps uh, programmability component to all of those cloud-based resources. So it's that strategy um, of DevOps cloud enabling that we're talking about. So you've got obviously, uh, Cisco Spark falls directly into that camp. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, we use Zendesk, we like it, it uh, works well for us. But I think that's a good example of where you take something that's uh, an existing help desk environment, um, which there's lots of traditional, you know, legacy versions of, you know, like, you know, server-based systems you install and keeps all the data locally. Whereas Zendesk uh, is a good example of turning that all on its head, holding all that information in a nice scale, uh, scalable, redundant way, uh, high availability, et cetera. But part of how they do it is they make sure there's an API that allows integration with other services. So it's a strategy thing. And by following that approach, that means you're using consistent, simple, open standards-based APIs that follow modern patterns. They're all, you know, web and mobile orientated. So it's all HTTP and REST-based protocols. Um, if nobody's, if you're not aware, REST is a way to submit, um, you know, operations from an API perspective that's been very widely adopted. Uh, so it's uh, kind of like the de facto way that a modern application would uh, expose their, you know, functionality would be via a REST-based API. And that's what I'm going to show you in a little bit more detail in a minute in the demo section. Um, but the other thing that by using, you know, approaching things from a DevOps cloud perspective, and it's all simpler, it's all web-based, and therefore there's a huge developer community, you know, quite literally 10 million plus people that have skills that can develop and integrate and perform, you know, various kind of tasks against uh, you know, those types of modern APIs. And that obviously means that there's low cost and low complexity in that type of sphere. 
So it wouldn't be great if we could bring those two things together, right? There's a challenge. Um, so effectively, we have the existing legacy, as we say, on-premise uh, Cisco communications uh, environment. Uh, you've got your specialised developers, of which there's a small number of, and you know, high skill and experience and limited availability. Uh, creating your bespoke applications uh, as required uh, becomes more of a barrier. So there's less things you're going to do because the cost is higher uh, when you want to customise your, uh, your your environment or deliver features and functions. But as converse on the left hand side, if you look at the DevOps cloud, you know, it's very inexpensive to create mobile applications and things like that because it's all commonplace. So the solution from our perspective is you simply drop automation FX in the middle. So it has all of those API integrations, uh, all those different protocols and different standards. You know, it can do CTI with JTAP, it can do AXL with SOAP. Um, it's got all the throttling requirements um, to interact with the RISPORT API, collects all that data and a nice consistent consolidated view uh, for you as well. Um, but on top of that, it takes all those core features uh, and all those legacy APIs and exposes them in a nice, clean and simple REST-based manner, which means that all of those 10 million plus general web developer skill sets that are out there, which are you know cheap and plentiful, so to speak, um, can now develop against Communications Manager. And that means that your current specialist developers, they can also take advantage of it as well. So they can probably prototype and create things a lot quicker because they understand the mechanics under the hood a lot more than a, a general web developer, so they get more value out of what they can create. But ultimately, it can take them less time and less cost to do that. So nobody loses out, and all we're really doing is opening up the reachability of Communications Manager, both in terms of uh, application development, but also in terms of connectivity with those cloud services. So this means that uh, you could now have uh, a new help desk ticket coming in from a customer, and that prompting a message to get pushed to a, a relevant agent's phone or in communication manager, and then they could accept that ticket and maybe even initiate a call from the handset and call the user back directly, or uh, et cetera. So it just opens up a lot of options in terms of the types of operations you can set up. So let's take you through some specific examples of what you can do with this API. Um, so this one's first for good reason, because it's been asked for for quite a long time. Uh, the first time that this actually, well, we moved forward on this actually was, I forget exactly when, but it's probably about four years ago. Uh, we struck up a partnership with uh, the DevNet team who uh, wanted to embed PhoneView as part of their sandbox offering, et cetera, and their IBT testing component. And uh, we partnered up with them and we also got some stand time in the DevNet area uh, along with them that they gave us. And the challenge was kind of set is, you know, is it possible to automate some of the things that PhoneView could do? Because they wanted to run a demo with text messages and, mess uh, and audio alerts and all these kind of things happening on a bunch of Cisco phones just to get people's attention, et cetera. Uh, so never uh, short of accepting a challenge. Uh, we actually managed to create an initial implementation of automation effects, which looks not a lot like it does today, in about uh, a month. Um, and we got kind of lucky. So that sparked the concept. That was originally based on PowerShell uh, scripting the way that we did it. And we saw that actually this is quite powerful, but as soon as we started showing it to a few customers at that point, as soon as we saw PowerShell in particular, nothing really wrong with PowerShell, but the problem is it's one language. And if you don't have skills in that language, you might have skills in other languages, and then it gets quite tricky to, to maybe translate those uh, or find experts. So what we so we kind of went back to drawing board a little bit, and we thought, well, actually, what's the best way to expose things? And then you know we struck the chord that a REST API is the best way to expose that automation functionality. So that's really where this idea came from. But it was sparked initially from you know the requirement to automate and script phone view. Now effectively, this means you can you know schedule or write a script or something that allows scheduling of you know key press macros and pretty much you know the core functionality of phone view to create a macro uh, you could actually build it manually it's just a string and I'll show it to you when we get to the demo it won't take too long uh, there's a link there which if you just bear with me a little second I'm going to come out of my presentation hopefully I can copy that cleanly and we'll put it in the chat window just so you've got it available 
think that copy and paste worked okay. Perfect. And uh, let me carry on. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's uh, one way you can do it, just use those URI instructions. These are features that the phone themselves understand that Cisco document, but we've got some extra ones on top uh, that you can use, and that's in, you know, pressing any kind of button on the phone and, and a few other actions, dialing numbers, some calls, things like that. So you do that manually, that's one option. Uh, another option, which I'll try to demonstrate if I can, is uh, recording a macro in phone view, taking that macro and then copying it into your script and then using your script to push that out. Um, you can also use phone views built in existing macros, so things like ITL deletes. So there you go, there's uh, Nirvana for you. Uh, you can schedule deleting everybody's ITL file at two in the morning, you know, uh, something like that, but I'm having to, uh, even using phone view to do it, it's obviously very quick and effective, but you can just kind of wake up in the morning and know that everybody's ITL file has been deleted, for example. So those kind of things too. Now, you know, once you've got your macro component, it's really a case of plugging it into some kind of script. Uh, use any language that you want. Uh, we're doing some samples initially using Python, um, but the general plan is to do some other samples in different languages. We'd be kind of curious which uh, language, if any, the people would be interested in learning or using. Uh, one thing I would also uh, recommend is Cisco have a very hard drive in pushing forward um, engineers like. Uh, you know, day-to-day -day UC engineers learning how to do some basic coding, you know, REST API 101 type things, etc. cetera. Uh, if you ha not everybody has to do it, but, you know, I would certainly entertain the thought of, do of looking into that. And Cisco DevNet team uh, do offer a whole bunch of training and uh, resources, the sandbox, et cetera, that you can leverage. Uh, so uh, I would say really take advantage of that uh, for your own benefit as well. And that's why we are trying to plug into that existing approach that Cisco are, are pushing forward. So that's one thing you could do. Uh, use the macros and phone view and push them out uh, via automation FX. Uh, another one, which is a nice just general use case, uh, is uh, CTI screen pops. So this is where a call comes into uh, your phone. Uh, that phone is being observed effectively from a CTI perspective. So there's a whole bunch of CTI events, you know, which would present a new call has appeared and here's the telephone number of the person calling in. You can use that CTI event information uh, to go and look up some information in a database somewhere, correlate that uh, calling number to other details about the, the person, uh, you know, type of customer they are, that kind of thing. And then you can push that uh, customer specific data uh, out to the user receiving the call. Uh, you could either do that as a text message or something to the phone screen if you wanted to, and our APIs allow all of that as well. So you can actually use the same API to then that you receive the event, uh, the webhook event from. You can then you know, use the same API back the way to push that message to the relevant phone. Or if you have a existing web-based application, you can just, you know, at server side, take that webhook and then correlate it with an associated application the user's using and, you know, through that existing application, push it that way. I mean, what we're talking about is quite a sophisticated thing here. I'm not expecting everybody to suddenly run away and create their own uh, CTI screen box, but we've designed the mechanisms of the API to allow these things to happen so that if someone really, really wants to do it, it, it will be able to deliver. So for example, that screenshot there is actually a company that we're uh, partnering with, which is called Quasi. Uh, they're actually using their test lab at the moment and using the Automation FX API to do exactly that type of thing where a customer comes into their store and they get, uh, <coughs> sorry, 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 a, a customer is in the building, they get a push message through, or alternatively, a customer calls in, and then you could have some profile information at the fact that it's a VIP person, that kind of idea. Uh, okay, messaging. So um, if you caught some of the previous uh, webinar sessions, something that was released recently is notification FX. That is um, a feature that sits on top of automation FX as well. And what that feature effectively does is allows you mass notification to Cisco IP phones. So you can push out uh, text, audio, uh, you can initiate live broadcasts as well, and if it's a wireless handset, you can make it vibrate. So that's just core functionality of the notification FX component. You can actually initiate messages from either a web interface, that's a screenshot on the right-hand side there, or alternatively, you can deploy an XML service on whichever phones you wish, 
and that XML service can provide some options or no options at all and just immediately initiate some messaging. But the way we built that notification FX feature is it would application enabled it immediately. So you can initiate and send messages uh, via the automation FX API. So the same messages you define as part of the notification FX functionality, you can pick one of those and then push them programmatically uh, out. So you don't have to initiate sending them from our application as in an XML service on the phone. You could have uh, some web page somewhere and you click a button click something in the web page and it pushes it out. You can wire it up to some building based system that, uh, you know, some alarm buttons or something. You could probably get those, uh, thinking about it, those Amazon web server buttons. It's quite literally a button that's internet connected. Uh, you can actually integrate it with that. You hit the button and then push out an emergency alert. I might actually do that for a bit of fun uh, when we get to Cisco Live now talking about it. Uh, sounds like a good thing to put together. Uh, that's one side of it. That's uh, using the API to send messages. But you can do uh, the same in reverse. You can actually um, have messages that go to phones or may go to phones. And they, that message can also trigger a webhook as well, if you wish. And that webhook will receive a copy of the data that's inside that message. So that means you can integrate, for example, a Cisco Spark Room with um, your phones uh, from a messaging perspective. So I could have some alert notification or something that I would push out to my Cisco phones. I could have a, a web, webhook set up and integrated with Cisco Spark using something like Zapier, for example, and built.io, hook.io. If that, then this type of things, any one of those systems you could use. Um, that webhook would trigger one of those cloud-based systems, which could then be tied into a Cisco Spark account and uh, wired up to, you know, really that, uh, text information across to one or more Spark rooms. So it just gives you that complete flexibility from a messaging integration perspective, as well as the cloud connectivity component. Provisioning. So this is where, um, you know, you, you may want to uh, have a user get started and you might have existing tooling where the manager plugs in some details into an online form and they would go away and set up email and other kind of things. Uh, well, it's ideal if they can also provision things on the telephone system as well as on your communication manager. And there's people will have, will have done this before as well, I'm sure, just using the native EXL SOAP interface. But we're providing a, an optional way to do it, which is a bit more uh, web or developer friendly. And what we've done is we've mapped the AXL API to a REST API, and we've made the data available both in JSON and XML format, because the XML format of the AXL messages is quite uh, verbose and complicated. Um, there's lots of namespaces and schema things to concern yourself about. And uh, by using it in JSON, we take care of a lot of that for you effectively. You just need to put in the relevant kind of JSON properties and uh, fields and things like that, and we take care of all the namespacing and other kind of complexities for you. So it just means it's easier to interact with the EXL API, which means that the same way that, as I'll show you in the demo portion, you can write some scripts that can do different bits and pieces with, um, <clears throat> you know, CPI screen pops and other kind of things, you could, uh, or automated testing of phone view, you could also script changes for provisioning, uh, et cetera. So different ways you can work with that. Uh, another thing that you can do, because we make the data available via a REST API and it's JSON-based uh, data that's available, means you can actually integrate directly with a web browser. We've actually done that ourselves. Uh, the phone FX functionality uh, that we released recently, the part of that functionality is an edit interface where you can make changes on phone configurations on Communication Manager. Technically, it's got an edit. Uh, compare uh, copy uh, capability. It's device level, and we're recently, uh, sorry, very soon we'll be releasing line level edits as well. But technically, we just use this same EXL API, uh, REST API underneath the hood. And the thing about it is, once you authenticate to Automation FX, and you can do that programmatically too, that means that that user scope automatically has access to all the relevant parts of the REST API. So it means you can take advantage of automation FX uh, authentication mechanism. So it means if you do write your own web-based application for doing provisioning or some other uh, operation, 
you can actually get that user to log in uh, with their communication manager credentials, which might be back to Active Directory anyway. And once they've logged in, then your, your kind of web-based application can just uh, do direct REST API calls on Call Manager from there and you know make changes on devices and user configurations and things like that. So it just opens up some options in the provisioning space. Uh, CloudFX, as I was saying earlier, is one of my favourite uh, new bits of technology that we've uh, been putting together. Uh, what this is, uh, well, let's think this through. One of the kind of key things we wanted to do was, you know, make the integration with Communication Manager easy because by opening up all those complicated APIs via a REST API. But what we thought was it's only half the solution because as a good thing to solve, good problem to solve, and lots of opportunities to take advantage of that. But ultimately, the way things are nowadays, you really want to have cloud-based integration with most things, right? So then what we realized is if we could make it very simple and secure to take that REST API and expose it as a public endpoint, then all those cloud-based systems, you know, Spark, Tropo, and uh, et cetera, and any other kind of web-based applications, could directly interact with uh, the relevant parts of your communications manager with, uh, without a lot of complexity um, straight out of the box. And the way that works is uh, there's two parts to, to CloudFX. One part is the gateway component. Now, you don't have to use this. This is just a layer on top for simplicity that we put together so we can get people up and running uh, really quickly and easily with cloud integrations. But um, there's two parts, and you, you you don't have to use both parts. You certainly would want to use the gateway component. That's the single public entry point, effectively. And that is quite literally api.unifiedfx.com. And any request that comes into that, um, it will protect the request because it will you know check for denial of service attacks. Uh, it will validate the request. So it will check um, the, the actual request structure and the model and the data is all uh, valid, et cetera. Uh, the way that we do that is we actually take the API specification of automation FX and the gateway has that structure. And if your request doesn't match the structure that's available on automation FX, it will reject it. So therefore it's uh, you know deep layer seven uh, type validation. Uh, a key part as well is obviously authenticates the request. Wouldn't really do the other things unless it obviously authenticates it as well, but uh, that takes your API key, uh, as I'll show you, and it just checks that uh, it's valid. And uh, assuming that it is valid, it will route down to your on-premise instance. So this is a multi-tenant uh, solution that we can have as many installations of automation FX. So everybody could, be, uh, all customers could be running it and each get their own, you know, unique and secure API keys and uh, they'll all come in with their own API key through the single entry point and part of that protect, validate, authenticate component is we can route it down to the relevant instance of automation FX. Uh, automation FX also does some extra checking as well once it receives it to also authenticates it as well. Um, now that gateway component, when it forwards the request, it's kind of validating, protecting, authenticating, and routing. Uh, when it forwards the request onwards to go, to go down to your automation FX instance, there's actually got two ways you can do that. Uh, you can actually use uh, our CloudFX Relay component, which I'll describe in a second, uh, or alternatively, you can just send it to your own de destination. So you could take automation FX, expose the REST API through your own firewall, uh, via DMZ, et cetera, and um, you can just and you can configure the our gateway component to route it down to your firewall instance. And what you can actually do from your firewall configuration is you could only accept requests that come from our gateway as well if you wanted to. So that means that you're not actually opening up even the automation FX API to general addresses. You'll only open it up to the gateway, and that already has an extra several layers of protection in front of it too. Uh, before it even would come in to your own firewall. Uh, so that's one way you could work it. And we'll be class that as probably a production use case as, as well, at least in the short term. Um, the relay component is there for convenience and getting up and running quickly. And initially, it's really just going to be for test uh, development type scenarios, uh, because also we're going to have to charge people for the use of the relay. We won't be charging for the gateway. 
uh, but uh, ultimately we'll have to charge for the relay at some level. But we've crafted it in a way that uh, the relay itself will um, basically run for 50 minutes um, and switch itself off automatically. Now you can keep switching on and things like that. Uh, we'll, we'll maybe have some limits around that too. But the idea is that I'm testing the application. I need to quickly and easily, you know, integrate with the cloud system. I switch on the, the relay component and the gate will route it down to my relay and my on-premise instance. But the key thing about that uh, CloudFX relay component is you don't need any firewall rules because it opens up an outbound connection to this um, intermediate component, the relay component, uh, and it maintains that outbound connection automatically, then that allows uh, secure inboard transport for those requests that get forwarded uh, via the gateway. Uh, I did intend to put a diagram together to try and explain this a little bit better from a visual perspective, but unfortunately we're out of time. But what I'm actually uh, going to do is hold a, a specific session on CloudFX um, in February the 21st. Uh, I've got a little thing at the end of the slides about it. Um, now, CloudFX, I'm telling you about it right now, but it's not something we're making available generally uh, to start with. Um, on a user by user basis, we can enable it if uh, you want to try it out, but it, it won't be there by default, let's put it that way. But um, we'll be working towards that for February timeframe. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's the CloudFX component to make it very easy to perform the cloud integration, but ensuring it's all neat, tight, and secure. Next one uh, in terms of use cases, automated testing. So this is effectively where you want to take um, test calls uh, that you might interactively perform in phone view on occasion, for example, which is obviously a lot easier than physically going around phones, but still takes a lot of time to um, you know, remotely plug away to perform a whole bunch of test calls. Um, so what this now means is because you can script all of the phone view functionality like that, you could build a script or a set of scripts that perform a whole bunch of call tests, you know, phone A calls phone B, phone A calls phone B, phone B transfers to phone C, uh, all those kind of things, phone A calls, PSTN destination, goes on hold, uh, that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So that means that uh, you can script all that. Uh, technically, it's using CTI call control to perform those operations. Allows opportunities for things like component load testing. You could dial voicemail. You could put 100 calls into voicemail at two in the morning every night if you wanted to, and you know, prove that that's still working. Um, you can uh, support. It supports multiple clusters, which means you can have, for example, a test cluster which you could stand up and go through your normal provider trunks, which we know a number of customers do already. And that means you can emulate PSTN destinations. So you can basically have a Cisco phone at one end, which basically rings on a PSTN uh, phone call and uh, your internal phone handset, so to speak, uh, which represent the customer base and the uh, users dialing out. Um, so that's quite typical. We've seen that a few times where customers have a test cluster that emulates the PSTN. So because our software uh, can interact with multiple different clusters at the same time, even mixed versions, et cetera, from a CDI perspective, that means that you can have some phones which are like PSTN type destinations and you can get your in-network, on-network uh, phones to call out to those uh, dummy phones, so to speak, answer on there, do whatever manipulations you want, put them on hold, and then make sure you get network level hold uh, coming back, et cetera. So that's uh, uh, one aspect of it. The types of operations uh, that you perform are quite varied and low level. Uh, you obviously get calling, answer, hold, unhold, uh, drop off hook, et cetera. We've tried to design the mechanisms to allow pretty much any way that a user can interact with a phone from a calling perspective. You know, that's along the lines of on hook dialing, off hook dialing, on block dialing, uh, you know. Uh, direct transfers, consult transfers, uh, etc. The way we've structured it. Uh, we even include things such as the ability to initiate silent monitoring as well, which uh, actually some people have already taken advantage of. Um, we also can handle multi-line support. So uh, when you're initiating a call test, you can specify a particular extension on the device, and if it already has multiple connections established on that particular line, you can choose a particular connection to perform the operation on as well. I mean, that's a bit more advanced scenarios, but the, uh, the way the mechanism has been designed that allows that to happen. And the whole thing is available through an open interface. And the way we kind of view this, it's making it uh, integration with Communication Manager, 
doing it the easy way, makes it a nice and clean and simple interactive REST API, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment. In fact, my goodness, uh, 45 minutes past already. I didn't think the slides were going to take this long. Um, it's uh, completely interactive, so all the operations you can perform uh, through the API page, the documentation page, and because it is a REST API, it is therefore language independent. Pretty much every single language of note out there, simple scripting to you know complex compiled languages, etc. They all support REST API integrations, and will have very mature and simple ways to to do that. So uh, it doesn't really matter what technology or language or skill set you've got, you can use this system. Uh, now, I put this slide in here, but I'll tell a bit more about how to get this, the Automation FX API component uh, after the demo. But ultimately, we've embedded it within PhoneView. And the way we did it is part of the kind of Phone FX, uh, Automation FX feature set. So something that we did not too long ago, it was released phone view version 6. It's still technically as a beta download right now. We'll probably wait till after Christmas and then we'll make it the production download. But that phone view 6.0 has automation FX baked inside it, an embedded uh, version of it. And this is the way that we put it together so that effectively there's a, a one button install uh, within phone view. Um, there's a, a little uh, phone FX button that you click. Because that's the most relevant feature set to phone view, hence why it's called phone FX instead of automation FX. But uh, automation FX is the platform uh, that gets installed. Uh, you click that button, um, you get this little phone FX setup with an install button. You quite literally click that button and it will auto deploy automation FX, auto configure it with the cluster you've got set up in phone view and uh, get, get you up and running straight away. And once you've got your automation FX instance, uh, uh, running, you can then now on this new version of software, which you can get, it also now exposes this API component along with the phone FX notification FX functionality we just recently incorporated. Okay, finally on the demo, and I've only got 10 minutes. Um, so I don't think I'm going to have to go into too much detail on the demo, unfortunately, given the time constraints. So I'll do my best to just touch on some aspects, right? So I've got phone view open. Yep, just make sure that's visible. And let me just turn on some automatic screenshots. Now I might have to tweak a couple of things. I didn't get a lot of time to prepare which phones I was using, but uh, I've got some test phones here, nice and easy. Test one, two, three, four, five, etc. <clears throat> so I'll leave them running in phone view, and I might flip back to this just to show you things happening. Um, and if I jump over, and don't be afraid, I'm going to start dabbling with some code, okay? Uh, now, what we are actively working on is uh, a little library or SDK, Software Development Kit, as you say, that is a front end tier to the Automation FX API. So what I'm going to show you is our approach to try and make it as simple as possible to perform all those things I've just described in that presentation. So we don't want people to suddenly think, oh no, I'm going to have to be an expert developer and start from scratch and figure out how, the hell, you know, how on earth I'm going to program against the REST API. We're, we're trying our best to bridge that gap as, uh, as best we can, obviously. So what I've got here is some samples. Now, this is something that we just threw together in a matter of days, so it's not neat and tidy. Uh, fingers crossed it even works in places. But uh, what we'll do is we'll tidy all this up over the next kind of month or two, uh, sooner if we can, but you know, wouldn't expect it to be all kind of where we want it to be for, for a couple of months, given it's Christmas, et cetera. And uh, we'll publish this and make it available online. Uh, before I maybe jump into that in too much detail, let me actually show you the Automation FX interface side of it. So I did have this open somewhere. There we are. Let me just maximize that if I can even hit the right button. There we go. Let me just reload it just to make sure I got a fresh browser session after all my working about earlier. Right, so what Automation FX, the API component, actually is. There's two menu items on the left here. Okay, these are additional components. They are available uh, with PhoneView Lab Edition and PhoneView version 6.1 or above. Okay, and I'll 
tell you uh, after the demo how to, to get that software. Uh, it is something we're classing as a preview feature. So notice the green bar down the bottom here. So whenever I'm on a page, one of these API pages, you get that big green bar just letting you know that this is something that's subject to change because it's still work in progress. Now, the ironic thing is the code underneath that the performs all operations is incredibly mature. It's the same code base in phone view. The bit that's changing is how we're exposing it via the REST API. So the API itself is fully functional. It's just the bits of data and how we present it is uh, subject to change. Uh, so if you do write some code or script or something against it, um, it is most likely you'll have to update that at some point before we actually officially release this and finalize the design of the interface. It's something we're targeting for March to finalize the API structure. It might take us longer depending on how things work out, but uh, that, that's at least what we're working towards. But what we're trying to do is make it available as soon as we can uh, so that people can start to uh, learn about it and explore it and maybe navigate into something of interest and in, in, uh, what they might want to use it for and you know hopefully provide us that feedback and the types of things you might uh, want to leverage with it and that helps us to prioritize uh, which parts uh, you know we expose and how we expose them etc so um, there's, there's two main uh, pages here there's a docs and an apps so docs is a kind of testable live interface that uh, Automation FX exposes to communications manager. And there's different types of uh, facilities uh, within this. So for example, if I go to the AXL component here, it shows me a bunch of options, different kind of color coded actions. So I can list out resources. And what I mean by a resource is pretty much anything within communication managers database, so that's phones, lines, um, you know, calling set spaces, partitions, all, all those kind of things. We'll see the list in a little second. So if I list out all those different resources and see a bit of data about them, I expand this one. Uh, I've got a drop down list here. So I've got all the different resources here. That's what the EXL API provides for us. I'll keep it simple. I'll just look for phones. So I go to phone. I've got some search criteria I can use in here. Because it supports multiple clusters, you can also specify that ID or name of a cluster. Uh, if you want to direct that request to a particular cluster, it will just pick the first one by default if you don't specify it. In this case, I've only got one cluster, so there's no choice required. Um, I click Try It Out. You can actually see the URL down the bottom. That's the technically the, the REST endpoint. You can actually just browse to that as well, uh, which you might do a little bit later. Um, and then this is the response. So it's basically just the name and description by default that it's given us. So if I want to pick a phone, randomly pick this guy, I'll copy his device name. And what I'm now going to do is go and get more detail. So I can do full CRUD operations on any of these resources, uh, but I'm not going to change anything, I don't think, at this stage. Uh, if I just go to Get and I scroll down and I put in that MAC address, choose phone, so that's the resource type, obviously, and hit try it out, then that submits that to your REST interface, which then forwards the request on to Communication Manager, takes the response, converts it back, and then presents it to you. So you can see here, oops, happens to be for some reason, a, a, randomly, a DX70 on a lab, uh, tells us the firmware it's set to, vendor configurations, all that, just the data, its line information, uh, et cetera, all that good stuff. Uh, now, this isn't really something I would expect people to use Aggressively, this is really for exploring and understanding what options and features are available. Um, that, you know, this is just a um, testing type interface, so to speak. So don't think this is how you use the software. This is just uh, how you educate yourself and how you test how these operations work. Now, I'm not going to get much more detail of Excel, but um, that's features available to you. Uh, CTI, uh, I may have a bit of fun with this actually. Let me. Uh, I've not got a lot of time for demos, so I might run over time, unfortunately. So we'll keep recording anyway if uh, someone has to drop off. But I think it's worth spending a bit of time on the demo, to be honest. Uh, the slides took a bit longer than expected. <clears throat> so let, let me dig in a little bit deeper. So for example, these are CTI call data. And uh, I can quite literally get call information on the entire cluster if I want to. I'm going to be a bit adventurous and try this out, but uh, this is something that you don't know. Oh, oh fantastic. There's actually a call in progress somewhere. Um, where's that? Oh, I think I know where that phone is. Uh, was that me that did that? Wait a second. Uh, 
I don't know, I don't know, I must be an old phantom call or something from when I was testing earlier. Let me just try something. Yeah, I've got a phone in front of me. Let's see if I go off hook on that one, will it appear? Oh, there it's there, excellent. Uh, so I've got a phone on my desk, uh, which is extension 21002. As I've gone off hook, uh, the CTI data, the talking state, when it went off hook, all that kind of stuff is available just as raw data. And I hang up and I refresh, and that call's going. So I've got that phantom call from the other phone from earlier, but uh, the one I just went offline there. So I can get a live view of the calls on call manager. Um, that was me being a bit sneaky and doing it for all the phones on the lab, but uh, you'd normally specify specific devices. I can hang up calls, you know, drop a call, things like that. I can place calls, etc. So if I want to make a phone call, I can go in here, I'll choose uh, 10135 maybe, if that's the right phone. And then we'll try dialing this phone on my desk, 2102. Try it out. Fantastic. The phone's ringing in front of me. And this is the call data from an, from that initiated call. Uh, so you see that it's talking state and when it started, <coughs> etc. So that's the raw data. Let me just cheat and manually hang that up for now. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, now, I can also do silent monitoring. Uh, that's that feature there. I'm not going to go into that, but you know that is quite a powerful feature. The fact you can do uh, silent monitoring on a single API call uh, saves a whole bunch of Java uh, complexity that uh, would save you months of uh, uh, effort normally. Uh, I can actually push raw data to the phone. This technically is just raw XML, Cisco IT phone text type objects. Anybody who's ever written like a simple XML service, um, they can take that same XML content, you know, Cisco IP phone text, etc. cetera, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can do it as JSON or XML. There's tricks we've got for doing that. And then you can push that content to the phone screen um, or do other operations or dial a number, things like that. Uh, we've also wrapped up Cisco IP phone execute. So all these things are available via the API. And this is why I'm kind of touching on this because I'm keen for people to give us feedback for what bits they like, don't like, or would want us to change. Uh, macro, this is a simple one. This is basically the macro feature from phone view. If you capture a macro in phone view, you can uh, submit it via the API, which is mostly for the scripting component, but that's just how it, it, you can test it from here. Uh, messages, messages are just resources there um, that you can uh, add and remove, uh, and you can also send them from here as well. Just to quickly show you, if I go to the notification menu, this is the notification FX side of the uh, functionality. So I can create a new message. Uh, so test two, save it, and then there's message to send a simple test to, I can somewhat more sophisticated advanced. I can get it to do some audio. Let's turn it on from here. I can get it to do text speech, for example, and I'll say test to not the most interesting conversation in the world, uh, if you push that message out. So these messages, you can actually programmatically push from here. So you can edit and change them too programmatically, uh, define new ones, delete ones that are there, modify them. Um, but you could also send them to, or send an ad hoc message as well. Uh, let's move on from there. Uh, phones, uh, this is something that we put together. This allows you to get a lot of data uh, in relation to phones. But uh, one of the things that's particularly adva advantageous for is the fact that it has IP address data in it. Now we have a rather sophisticated uh, progressive refresh technique in automation FX, which will very efficiently get status data from your communications manager uh, as, in a timely manner without you know, affecting its API limitations, et cetera. And that data that we gather is all available in this uh, OData phones uh, endpoint. OData is a standard-based interface that we decided to expose it in. So there's a lot of existing tools and systems that can work with OData. You don't, you know, it's actually quite simple to use directly uh, anyway. So that, in that case, I just grabbed quite literally all the phone data that we've got uh, on that cluster. We can perform SQL operations from here too, if you want to. There's more than one way to do that, obviously, but just for convenience, it's part of the set. Uh, webhooks, uh, a webhook is basically a web event. And what that means is if something happens somewhere, some, uh, you know, a phone goes off hook or a number's dialed, et cetera, um, then send that data relating to that event to a web URL. That's really what a webhook is. So if I go into here, I've probably got some defined 
I can list out the web hooks that I've uh, created. Uh, so one of the demos that I've put together today, um, I've got it running on this machine. So it's not changed its IP address. Might be able to show that working. Um, but effectively, what happens is, if a CTI event happens, it will push the CTI data to that URL. So that URL can then be an application that interprets that data, looks up, um, you know, who that person that's calling is, and then notifies somebody accordingly, or just captures log data, etc. So that's generically what a webhook is. Now, to use this interface, I'm logged in to this web session, so it's using a cookie for to authenticate these requests. That's why I could do a live test on that there. But in reality, if you've got an external system you're going to integrate it with, you need something like uh, an API key. And to do that, you go to this apps page. So the apps page, if I want to create a new application that can integrate with the API, I just click new. Um, as a default name, I can, you know, let's just call it uh, the best app, if I could even type properly. Um, it generates an API key for us. We can refresh that or choose, you know, whether, uh, recycle and get another one. Um, the Cloud FX feature is not going to be available at this stage. It's something that we're aiming to make available in about uh, February timeframe. But some of the interface components are there. Kind of to tease you, to be honest. Uh, but it, you know, we might hide them at some point. But until it's ready, but the, it's there. But it won't do anything with you with your app at the moment. Um, but it at least gives you a little bit of a heads up of what it's there and what it's for. So I hit save on that and it's now created this new application entry. If I click the little I symbol there, it shows me the API key uh, that's linked to that app. And I click copy and it puts it in my clipboard for me. So if I was writing a script somewhere, I could then use that key. <clears throat> if I want to uh, enable that key for use via the cloud uh, gateway, I can basically flick the switch there. Now, there's a little bit more to that. Let me just show you that in a little more detail. If I flick that CloudFX switch, if I leave this blank, it will use our CloudFX relay, and I'll show you a little bit more of that in a second. But if I want to use my own firewall uh, and entry into your network to automation FX, you basically put the, the URL where you're exposing that host name, IP address, etc., and uh, the gateway component would forward it to there. Now, let me go back a bit. So if I go to the services page, just to try and explain a little bit. Now, this CloudFX stuff will not be available today. I just want to briefly explain it while I'm on it. Um, there's two parts. So the top part here, that relates to the gateway component. So that, if that's running, that means you're talking to the gateway and sharing your API key details uh, in a secure manner with it. Um, so that's the top level part that needs to be enabled. Um, but you can use CloudFX without the relay. So this service would normally be stopped. Uh, but if I use the relay component, uh, that allows me to open up an outbound connection to the internet for the gateway to use and allow transport directly into that API. Uh, so say that relay component is something that effectively costs us money to provide. So we've got a free model that we're hoping to offer it with. But uh, later on, we may have some subscription package for, for using, uh, you know, like a mobile contract, so many data, so much data and things like that. But to be honest, there's so many ways you can connect things to the internet. We really put that in there just to, to make it really quick and easy to get up and running. Okay, so that's the Automation FX API web page side of it. We're already past there. I'm going to keep on trucking. I reckon I've probably got about 10 to 15 minutes. I don't know how many questions there might be, but uh, I'll keep going for now. And uh, we are still recording anyway. Let me jump to the code bit. Now, hopefully I've not frightened anybody by sharing this, but what I've got, let me just kind of minimize a couple of things here, is uh, some sample bits of code. Now, we've written a tiny little library, which we're not publishing yet, but we will make it available for you. In fact, I've got a URL I need to share with you so you can start looking at it. See when you're on this uh, Automation FX API page, there's this little preview thing. There's a little button down the bottom that says more information. If I click that, it takes us to this GitHub repository we put together. Let me just copy that link and send it to you in the chat window. There we are, click the right button. Now that actually has an overview of what Automation FX and Cloud FX is, is all about. It has the API specification in there too, allows you to kind of simulate some of those calls. 
uh, etc. So they're going to give you some background. What we will be doing is updating and publishing more information resources there. So the library I'm about to show you that we're building right now, in this case in Python, uh, we will publish uh, to that uh, either to that GitHub repository or to a, 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 an equivalent repository and link to it uh, from there. So that's like your landing page from a documentation point of view. Now, some of these uh, samples are pretty trivial, to be fair, and we're trying to keep them as small and simple uh, as we can. I've actually got a little bit of a running order uh, that I want to go through it, and I may not even execute all of them. I might just talk you through them, to be fair. Now, the way this is currently structured, we've got a little library uh, called AFX at the moment, which exposes a bunch of different actions. There's different kind of groups of those actions, the CTI, AXL, and message actions we've got defined here, and that's the kind of fu function names technically that you can call and give them various arguments. Now, what we will be doing as part of building at this library is all these, this will be self-documenting, you know, so when you hover over the function there, it will tell you about, you know, what a target is and what a macro is and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so you'll, so if you're writing code in this kind of tool set, uh, et cetera. And just to be clear, I'm using Visual Studio Code, uh, which is completely cross-platform. You can use it in Mac, Linux, and Windows, uh, et cetera, and obviously Python as well as cross-platform too. So you can run it in any environment. Um, and technically what's happening is when I call, uh, I've got a little config definition, which I'm struggling to remember where it is. Uh, hold on a second. Let me just find it because it's worth sharing probably here. Yeah, there it's there. So uh, that is my configuration. So I'm not using CloudFX. So therefore, it's going to use this information. So that's the local IP address and things like that. This is the API key uh, that I'm using at the moment. That's one of those app entries I created on the uh, demo system uh, is using that to authenticate effectively. Uh, so that's your top level configuration. Now, we'll make that even easier and in a more sensible discrete location, but that's currently how it's able to communicate. And effectively, we'll get some little wrappers that perform those same operations. So try, try to explain that again. If I go back to here and I go back to this docs page, so when I'm sending a macro, right, I'm basically choosing the phone I want to send it to and the macro string. If I submit that into this interface and hit try it out, it is identical to running that line of code, okay, with that all preset up with that configuration with the server address and uh, API key, etc. This particular one, will reset a phone background. Now, let, let's maybe just be adventurous and try this. If I go to, ah, the logo, there we are. Let's try it on this one. Am I taking screenshots? Let me just check this is actually still live and responsive. Yep, it is, excellent. Let me just cancel that. So what I'm gonna do, this uh, test Pi phone here, which is a custom background in it, I'm actually going to change its background image to factory default. Now, I'm a little bit lazy. Uh, I captured a macro in phone view earlier. I basically performed a sequence of actions using the keypad, etc. It captured those actions in the activity log there. I then selected those items in the activity log, right click, create macro, and it populated the macro into there for me. Now, the macro that it created, I've got saved here. It's in my notepad. So it's just press the settings button. I uh, put in a pause command that gives you timing. So that means it'll press the settings button, pause, CMD pause will wait for one second, and then it'll press number one, wait another second, etc. So that gives you full control over both the sequencing and the timing of those uh, operations, right? So that particular set of button presses in this case will reset the background image. Now, what I've just realized is that macro wasn't for those phone models, so that's going to fail immediately. So let me just find uh, another phone I can do it on. Uh, do you know what? Oh, yeah, that does have an image. Oh, no, no, that's got a factory default on it. Damn. Don't think I can do that demo on that phone. Let me try and find another phone I can. Now, unfortunately, the demo lab we're using doesn't potentially have all the phones in it. So I um, have to try and find a phone that's in there. Right, let's see if we get lucky. Um, I'll try it with this phone here, that this uh, extension 1052, right? This is a real, real uh, 
risk was short here. <clears throat> so it has a custom background on it, 10052. Let's go to the script here. And if I change this to 10052, just double check, that was the number, 10052. Um, then what's happening here is we're using the kind of little API here. It queries the phones. We then search within those phones. We're searching in this case for a directory number of uh, 10052, which uh, will hopefully return the phone object. Uh, we then pass that phone object and perform a macro action on it with that sequence there. And that's the one that I captured in the notepad earlier. Uh, okay, so if I quickly, my mouse is getting in the way here. Oh, how does that get out of the way? Oh, man, because I'm talking, it's telling me I'm talking, I can't see my run button. There we are. Right, so if, I, if I'm quick here and my phone gets found, I click this run button in the top right corner and I'll flip over to phone view and hopefully we'll see it change its background. Right, fingers crossed. Click the button, script's running, change here, cross your fingers, and either we'll see absolutely nothing uh, or some activity. Oh, it's, it's going down the, the nothing bucket. Right, hold on a second, let's flip back. Now, it will have sent it. The problem is uh, I think it's a phone that isn't on the lab. Now, I do have a phone that is on the lab which actually already has a background image on it, uh, as a default background, so it's not very interesting, but at least I can hopefully show you some activity. Now it's that one there. There we are, it's refreshed. Now let me just reset the position on this one. We'll give it another try, and we'll move on to something else if this doesn't fly. Okay, <clears throat> let's try it on this handset. So that's 21002. I'm pretty sure this is in the Demo Labs uh, phone set which is here, so that was 21002, save, right, fingers crossed, let's try it again, so quick press the button, flip over to here, and just make sure the screenshots are coming. Now I can actually see that phone in front of me doing the operations, but <clears throat> I have too much running on this phone at the moment, so it's screenshots not updating very quickly. So you saw about two screen grams there, it's actually quite quick, so only uh, managed to get a couple, so that, Basically changed the background to the factory default, but unfortunately that phone was already on the factory default, so didn't really, other than seeing some button getting pressed, you didn't really see it do anything obvious. Uh, so that's how you can script out macro actions. Uh, next one I want to show you would be screen pops, but uh, can I do that today? I'll give it a quick try. Uh, see, I had to change my phones around quite late on, so I'm not sure how well all this works. Let me spin it up. And see if it does. Now there's a good chance the IP address on my laptop changed, so uh, this may not do much. But if it doesn't, I'll just talk you through what it's for. Now what I need to do is make a call from a particular phone that I'd set up earlier. And I'm just going to have to log in to another computer over here to find it. So bear with me a little second. <coughs> Excuse me. There we are, that's that one there. I'm just doing, you can't see what I'm doing right now, I'm just on another computer, but I'm just bringing up an instance of 4FX and I'm gonna try dialing that number. Oh yeah, oh, no, this, actually I was gonna do it programmatically just because I can. I think that's the right device name. Let's go to here, let's go to here. Let's go phone ID, that one. And we're dialing two one zero zero two. And let me jump back to phone view and we'll see if this comes through. Right, so I've placed a call into this phone. So it's just an IFT. Now, if the screen pop works, when I answer the call, there we are. Uh, I may just take a second update on phone view there. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, it's not, not the most useful screen pop in the world, it's just the proof of the mechanics. Uh, but all it's basically done is push a text message to the phone screen uh, telling it that it got a call from 50,005, which the user already knows because that's the extension they called them. But the point is, I could have looked up that data, it could have been a mobile number, etc., found a customer record, and then pushed that customer record out to the phone. Uh, well, I wanted, well, I wanted to kind of show you how that's possible is this little bit of code spins up a web server listening on this uh, kind of pop URL 
and effectively it takes the data that's sent to it, parses it, and uh, extracts the, the number from it. What it would do in a real world scenario is it would take that number and then look up some data somewhere, get some customer records, and then what this bit does here, uh, whatever it was again, pop phone, is that pop phone function goes up to here and it compiles a little text message which it then sends to the phone. Now, it doesn't have to send it to a phone, it could have sent it to some other related application, etc. But my point is, just a few lines of code, you can uh, effectively implement a screen pop functionality, which is pretty advanced and powerful contact, set, contact center level features. As I say, our intention is to tidy up and update this library and have these samples that I'm running through with you that you can hopefully spin up in your own environment nice and quickly and easily. Uh, next one is messaging, uh, demo 7845, so that's that phone again, I think that's the one over here, isn't it? Yep, let me just get rid of that call and stuff. <clears throat> Excellent, oh yeah, I just remember I need to stop this code. So what this one is, is uh, it uses a function called uh, send message. This message one corresponds to this message one in here, right, which currently says hello world two, uh, not very interesting. Um, and I'm basically programmatically going to send that message to a set of phones. So that's the message to send based on the what's entered through in the web interface there. You can send the raw message, just your own raw message too, but it's a little bit easier to do when it's one that's defined in the user interface and then you just instruct it to send it. Uh, this second parameter is the destination. So this destination is a filter name. If I go back to here, what you should see is there's uh, some filters I created. So if I choose demo 7941, oh, so I've actually, 7845 hours, what I'm going to do. Then you can see the filter is looking for registered 7845s, of which I only have one in this lab. Um, so that means if I send that message to that, we should see it appear on this phone. Okay, let's give that a try. Let's jump back to the code. Now, what you have to appreciate is that's just a one line statement. We're trying to do this in a way that is really simple. Um, you know, this operation here just, you know, finds the phone for you based on different criteria. And then all you do is once you've found your phone or phones, you can then just look through and send out uh, whatever messages you want. Uh, or a single operation to multiple phones when it's a filter destination like this one. So let's give this a try. So we're going to send message one to demo 7945. We hit the play icon in the top right corner. We click the flip over here. Oh, I don't know if you'd have heard that. Actually, it's got text -to speech enabled. So it said hello world to, to me uh, on the phone. And we can see the messages there. <clears throat> and I think we can figure it to auto disappear as well. So I should do that in a little second. There we are. So, and I know this might be for some people a little bit uh, unusual, different, out of your comfort zone, etc. you know, talking about some code and things like that. Uh, but say we're working really hard to, you know, lower that barrier uh, of entry as much as we can. Uh, so that was messaging. Next one is provisioning. So I got a little sample over here. Uh, this is a great one, actually. I'm trying to remember where the hell I got working. Oh, yeah, it was on that phone there as well, Fun enough. So what this does is this uses the AXL API. Um, what the hell is that one doing? Next, flips through, get all phones. Oh, yeah. I think I was just me mucking about lots of different types of demos in here, technically. Uh, so it's not really doing anything useful at the top here. Uh, the last demo, which I think is a bit that uh, should kick in if I do this correctly, uh, what it does is it goes and gets all the line information on uh, call manager via AXL technically, it searches through those and it finds one which is an extension number, in this case 21002. It grabs its uh, unique identifier and then it goes and gets the full information on that line, uh, so it's full line configuration uh, data <clears throat> for the line uh, 21002. Um, and then what it does is it prints out the current calling for, uh, call forward all destination, uh, which should be none at the moment. And then it actually does an update and we can set it or unset it. So what I'm going to do, if I type in a destination here and save this, <clears throat> let me just clear the log window down the bottom there. And then I hit run. <clears throat> so you can see it's got two outputs. It says none and it says 
50,005. So that's the before and after. So that means it has set the call forward. But just to kind of prove it, if I jump to phone view, we can see the phone is now forwarding to that number. Let's do it in reverse. Let's go back to here. Let's empty out the forward destination, save it, run it again. We can see previously it was that number and now it's set to none. I jump back to the phone and we can see call forward also now turned off. Um, so we've, we've had customers ask us about things like, should I send a text message? Um, you know, a user could send a text message from a mobile number and it could go to their desk phone uh, in the office and call forward it back to the mobile, you know, an emergency scenario and things like that, DR scenarios. Um, so we've been asked these kind of things uh, and it's like, we're not really in, uh, in the uh, space of um, creating custom applications. We're really about packaging stuff. Uh, but ultimately, what we've done is provide a way for system integrators, partners, and things like that to, to do these things. And I've gone well over the time limit. I am still recording, so if people have dropped off, you can obviously catch this up. Uh, let me just check if I had one other thing. Yeah, yeah, I've got one last thing to show you from a code point of view, and then we'll finish off uh, slides, and if there's any questions, we can cover. So automated testing. Uh, this is something that could be fairly popular or may or not, who, who knows, uh, but it's just something, again, it's an actual extension of what phones you can do uh, to script it. So what I've got here, again, I've got my phone list and I'm then searching for a bunch of extensions. So I've got phone one, two, three, four, and five. I've got two little test definitions I've created. So there's a, a simple call test, call from one phone to another, wait 10 seconds, hang up. Uh, a more complicated one, which does uh, consult uh, transfer and you pass in the, the three test phones that you want to perform the operations on and then use all the various steps. Now hopefully that should be quite clear because you can see that place a call, that's a uh, call from uh, you know test phone one to test phone two's uh, directory number, uh, answer on test phone two, pause for 10 seconds and then uh, drop on test phone one. Now something that we'll be adding uh, is the ability to take a snapshot or validate the state of the phone at a particular point in time. So that's how you'll prove if the call get connected and media is going backwards and forwards. So that's a, a piece of functionality we'll be uh, adding to the API. But you can, I've, I've commented it in there to show that's the appropriate time you can then prove the call works. And you can just return some data or print some output or export some report the information to see if it succeeded or failed, obviously. Uh, I've got another one here, a bit more complicated, which does a consult transfer. So basically up here, I've got my test definitions effectively, and I can take in different arguments and things like that. And then this is where I've got a little bit of code to run them. Now, let me just jump back to phone view and jump back to those uh, test phones. And Fingers crossed, we can do a, at least a simple phone call. Now, yeah, so this one here, I've got a simple call test, P1 and P2. If I go back up, P1 and P2, that's extension uh, 10135 and 36. Jump back to here, and that's those first two phones, test one and test two, hopefully. So let's run it. And let's jump back. Am I actually updating screenshots? Just give it a manual kick. Two seconds just to check something. Oops, it is it. That's going to do a bad thing there. Yeah, let me try that again. One more time. I'll probably just change something in the at the end before I started the webinar. Oh. Oh, there we go, that kicked in this thing. So you can see it's established a call. You can see the timer ticking away, four, five, six seconds. After 10 seconds, basically, it's automatically hanging up. So that's just a nice simple call test. Just to be adventurous, because you're, you're, if you're still with us and being patient, let's try the consult transfer and see what happens. So I've flipped over to that test. Should use test room one, two, and three. Let's spin it up and see what we get. There we are, so a call between phone one and phone two. Waits a few seconds, I believe. Phone two uh, goes in consult transfer, types in the digits for uh, phone three, uh, then completes the consult transfer, I believe, uh, and then the calls landed and answered on the third phone, uh, waits a little bit and then hangs up, uh, etc. So not the most sophisticated tests in the world, um, but you can hopefully get the idea that it's just a few simple statements you have to put together. 
And again, as I say, we're looking to put some good samples that give you a, an easy starting point with some good um, examples you can work from. Right, that's me in terms of the demo section. Let's jump back to the slides and finish off if you're still with us. I really appreciate it. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, PoemView 6.1 Lab Edition includes that Automation FX API for free, fully functional. You obviously still got the same limitations, it's 50 phones for Lab Edition, that kind of stuff. Uh, it really is recommended to just use it in a lab environment, not against production systems. Not that it'll only break anything, but you'll just be disappointed because you'll only get the random 50 phones you can work with. Um, it uh, is available as part of the embedded phone FX automation FX instance with phone view. So that's uh, when it was that install slide, the little phone FX button you click and the install button that puts it in for you. Once you log into the admin interface, just using a normal call manager user account, you'll see those two pages, the API pages, etc. And over time, we'll start to include and embed some of this uh, kind of sample scripting with it too. Um, we actually see a, a great opportunity for Cisco partners to provide value add to the clients through this. And this is why we're trying to make this as freely and openly available as possible so you can learn how it works and work with uh, the guys at DevNet, et cetera, to, to learn how REST APIs work or even just use your sample code and, and tweak it uh, to your own uh, use cases. Uh, if you do are interested in finding out more and partner with us, just contact us at sales at unifiedfx.com. And uh, it's available today. We're actually doing it as a as the PhoneView Alpha release. Uh, this will become the beta release in uh, probably uh, January, I would imagine, once we push uh, 6.0 out soon we'll download. So technically, it's PhoneView 6.1, and that's the URL, which uh, I'll just copy into the chat window. Oops, there is it. Oh man, write that up properly. There we are. Like so. There we are. So you can fill your boots. And just in terms of an overview of product releases, so we've released a whole bunch of new stuff the last couple of months. It's pretty hard going, but we got there. Uh, so it's migration effects, three zeros out. What would FX T0 is uh, actually it's technically still beta download. We're, we meant to change that recently, but we forgot to flip switch and publish it as a production release, but we're doing that shortly. So technically it's forward slash beta on the board one. Uh, for version six, that still is a beta release right now. I mean, a lot of people are using it. It's just that it's coming up to Christmas. So we're going to wait after Christmas before we make it generally downloadable. Um, there's a couple more events we've put on. Um, if you want to go back and re-register, we've got a, a recap on migration FX T0 on 24th of January. And uh, the cloud effects component, we're going to go into that in a lot more detail and hopefully we'll be able to make it available as well on the, uh, as part of that release on the 21st of February. Uh, okay, I'll be honest, see if anybody stayed with us all that time. Let me uh, just jump back and stop the recording and then we'll see what questions we can get through, if any.